from cold and crisp and future-oriented uh, Davos, the World Economic Forum, and my pleasure as the moderator today, my name is Rachel Kite, I'm a professor of practice at the Blavatnik School at Oxford University, is to introduce a first mover himself, who needs no introduction, but Special Envoy John Kerry to uh, get this conversation going, and then we'll have an extraordinary panel discussion with companies that have really turned a coalition that has had uh, a real ambition uh, into a coalition which is actually acting and making a real difference. But um, from one of the great inspirations of this First Mover Coalition, please, John, the floor is yours. <laughs> Take care. very, very much for joining us here today. Uh, Rachel, thank you for your terrific uh, stewardship in many respects uh, and helping to guide us in all of this. And thank you to first movers who are here uh, and those of you representing some of the first movers. I, I'm beginning every session that I engage in here by just trying to clarify something because I think there's a few questions out there. Uh, I am not retiring, folks. <laughs> uh, I want to make that clear. I am shifting my efforts to where I think uh, they can be best used in an election year in the United States. Uh, and uh, facing the fact that the Congress is not going to obviously grab this by the baton the way you all are and the way we need to. So I really want to put my efforts uh, into to get those done. Um, and uh, let's understand why this is so critical, first of all. Uh, we're all experts. There's nobody here who needs to be sort of fully educated, but sometimes we all need to be reminded that <clears throat> we are dangerously close to the precipice of tipping points that we've been warned about, of climate chaos that comes about because, uh, as we know, this past year was by far the most turbulent in every single respect. Heat, uh, the warming, the, the uh, deforestation, the levels of emissions, the amount of subsidies going to the very people who are creating the problems. I mean, you run the list, and it really uh, is a challenge. But, here's the but. You should feel good about the road we have traveled in a mere two years. When we stood up in Glasgow, and we announced this First Movers Coalition, uh, we had maybe 20 some companies or something. Uh, and we are now uh, over 100 and growing. And the question is, we, will we, as part of the mission, which is not just <coughs> putting in orders for green products or creating partnerships within the framework of the FMC itself, but will we make the decisions globally and push a whole bunch more folks to join up? and to be part of this effort. Because our problem is not that we don't know what to do. It's not that we don't, in fact, have uh, you know, certain solutions staring us in the face. Some of them are being implemented and deployed right now. It's that we're not doing any of what we need to do big enough and fast enough. And it is a challenge, major crisis, with respect to uh, our ability to be able to win this battle. Now. Money, money is critical to our ability to be able to do that. And kudos, I mean, I, I cannot thank enough the CEOs of First Mover Coalition companies who made the decisions that they're going to be leaders, that they're going to take their companies and do something that takes a little bit of explanation to your, you know, if you're publicly held, to your shareholders. And if you don't have to explain to them, privately even, the people and families and otherwise who sometimes challenge the decision to spend a little more than you have to, to change your bottom line. But it is only by making that decision that we're gonna be in a place where we get to accelerate this transition fast enough. Now, we've tried to do our part. The reason, one of the reasons why I am comfortable saying uh, I'm not gonna lead our team into the next COP 
is because I believe we had an historic cut in Dubai. I believe that the fact that we got 195 nations to sign off on language that says we will transition away from fossil fuels is historic. And it's not a freestanding sentence. It's a sentence that is modified by the phrase, uh, in keeping with the science, which means 1.5 degrees is our North Star and we have to keep pushing in that direction. It also says, accelerating in this decade, and it also says in keeping with net zero by 2050, which means you have to meet a certain curve of reduction and be transparent and accountable in the public sector. So this is a major step forward. It's accompanied by other steps. It's accompanied by the fact that for the first time at a COP, there was a major devoted day to methane. And China and the United States held a joint conference in which China has already now put the, out its national plan, which we worked on uh, two years ago and we originally uh, uh, agreed to announce uh, in uh, Glasgow. And we all agreed that all greenhouse gases will now be part of the NDCs. Imagine that in the year 2023, methane wasn't even included in the NDCs of a whole host of countries. And if you add to what I just said, adaptation, <laughs> initiative, and the way in which we're now gonna move with respect to loss and damage, where we created something that a lot of people thought was a showstopper, a cop killer, and something that was gonna prevent us from ever getting progress, well, guess what? We worked all summer, all uh, through a series of meetings, five of them in the end, in order to be able to try to set ourselves up to get that done on the first day so it didn't become a destructive uh, and, and uh, counterforce to everything else we needed to do. We won that battle. So we are now poised, folks, to really take this idea of a first mover coalition and run with it. And you saw in that video uh, all the things that are able to be done now. So we are, uh, I think in the midst of one of the most powerful examples of what we can do on the demand side to be able to affect the marketplace. And the uh, fact is that, that uh, you know, what we've accomplished is really amazing. We've amassed over 110 out of about 100 members, 110 specific purchasing agreements from almost 100 companies. We have taken together all of this effort by the FMC represents about $16 billion of commitments that are being made. It's the largest private demand signal for clean technologies in history. And we're already seeing this demand is, is uh, uh, creating catalytic uh, uh, consequences in, within the other technologies. And when you pair the necessary policy work that <coughs> excuse me, we've been doing on the supply side, the IRA for instance, you have a combination that can change the marketplace much more rapidly than it would be otherwise. So what I'm really excited about is this entity, the FMC, is doing the innovative work in order to meet their 2030 purchasing agreements. It's happening. And the commitments that first mover companies have made uh, are, are obviously fundamentally challenging, uh, but they are commitments that will change the way that we procure our most basic goods, steel, aluminum, concrete, jet fuel, shipping, shipping industry. Together with the IMO that changed its rules this year and the shipping industry, Yara, thank you, Maersk, thank you, MSC, thank you, you stepped up. And now I am told that the entire shipping fleet will probably be turned over in the course of about 20 years to no carbon, zero carbon, low carbon uh, sourcing. That's incredible <laughs> when you think about where we were only two years ago. So this is a great example of the way in which the marketplace can act responsibly. It's, it's truly the upside, best side, if you will, of, of capitalism which brags that it has the ability to be able to allocate capital more effectively than any other methodology. Well, this is proof really in the pudding that you can be responsible in ways way beyond what the normal marketplace is willing to accept. Oh, there are almost uh, 100 offtake agreements, different from the commitments that are made, 
with uh, innovative suppliers and they're moving voluntary pledges to real bankable contracts. These offtake agreements represent a coming together of government, suppliers, buyers, financiers, and they do something very complicated and difficult, but they're doing it. And it's gonna have an impact on the market. My bottom line is this. I, I am convinced now because of what, what is happening in the marketplace. You know, smart CEOs of the biggest companies in the world, Microsoft, uh, uh, you know, Google, Apple, Salesforce, FedEx, Boeing, uh, Ford, Mercedes, that's what I mean, automobile dealers, all through the food chain. We are seeing CEOs make the decision that they're committing their companies to maybe pay a little bit of a green premium, but in the end, create a supply chain that is gonna provide everybody the ability to be able to join up and enjoy the benefits here. So you're gonna hear from a handful of our members today about how they are driving transformation through FMC commitments. And, and, we, and you know, it's absolutely critical that we accelerate. I am convinced beyond any doubt that because of the decisions being made in the marketplace now, because, I mean, you know as well as I do, even if, uh, you know, I don't want this, obviously, but if you wound up with a different president who was opposed to climate crisis, I got news for you. No one politician anywhere in the world can undo what is happening now. The marketplace is doing this. And the only issue for all of us is, is not whether or not we can get or will get to a low carbon, no carbon economy globally, we will. The only question is, will we get there in time to meet the challenge of the scientists in order to avoid the worst consequences of this crisis? That is what is at stake. So I really look forward to hearing from our folks today uh, who are gonna uh, lay out to, to everybody here uh, the ways in which all can participate in this transformation. It's the biggest transformation in the economies of the world in all of human history. It's also the greatest business set of opportunities that we've ever known in all of human history. And smart people are seeing that opportunity, and I think it's gonna be the job creator and the energizer of our economies uh, that are going to uh, really transform the world over the course of these next months and years. So with that, please, let's get the uh, panel and learn what everybody is up to. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. I, we need one more chair. Thank you very much, uh, Special Envoy Kerry John, if I may. And thank you for um, just uh, shifting role a little bit. Uh, we, we, we continue to need your uh, vision and enthusiasm. So, um, first mover coalition, a couple of years ago in Glasgow, uh, started small and is now sending this extraordinary demand signal across all kinds of value chains in what used to be called hard to abate sectors. Um, and so, first of all, I'd like to go to one of the early government members of the First Mover Coalition, uh, to Minister Tan Si Ling, uh, Second Minister for Trade and Industry. Um, sitting, Singapore sits at the hub of global shipping, of uh, logistics, transportation, etc. Um, we're going to hear from CEOs who are doing extraordinary work along their value chains. What, uh, what more could, on the public side, on the government side, what more could governments do to respond now to the demand signal that we, 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 we're beginning to create across the economy? Thank you. Um, first, first and foremost, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, enjoy, always enjoy listening to um, a special, uh, you know, advisor uh, John's um, remarks and that sense of optimism. It really sort of uh, gives us the kind of gusto to move forward. Um, I, I think that uh, for us, we um, we're very, very excited uh, with the FMC um, and the movements moving forward. We believe that fundamentally, government. Um, is really um, and can really perform the role of a, a catalyst and an enabler um, for many of these um, uh, initiatives and driving systems that um, you're going to start. And really in terms of the development of low carbon technologies and markets and 
how we can actually achieve partnership um, with the industry and also to see how we can enable and also channel market demand into areas where it's needed most. So, as I've said earlier on, um, beyond the catalyst, the government has to play the role of an enabler. So one of the key things that we have done, and perhaps if we could share with you some of our experiences, is that uh, at the end of last year, we did an end-to-end -end RFP um, for ammonia, uh, the, the development of low-carbon ammonia solutions. And what we did was that um, uh, the expressions of interest concluded in October, and we will be issuing a close RFP, a request for a proposal to six short listed consortiums. And this, uh, when it's done, we will be announcing something towards the end of uh, this month. It would move Singapore another step closer to being one of the first countries in the world to test and to deploy a direct ammonia combustion power plant and to support the holistic assessment of ammonia bunkering for shipping. So we are also working with um, multiple other ammonia suppliers, shipping lines, storage, providers, technology providers, and also bunker suppliers to ensure that we are able to scale up the required infrastructure to support and to cater for ammonia bunkering uh, for both ocean-going ships and domestic harbour crafts. And uh, obviously we're developing procedures, standards and regulations for safe bunkering of uh, ammonia. Now for aviation, um, we set up an International Centre for Aviation Innovation, or ICAI, just last week to facilitate the development and the adoption of technologies for the aviation sector, which focuses primarily on the Asia-Pacific region. So we'll partner governments, industry, we'll uh, partner RIs, the research institutes, to undertake R&D projects in several new key areas, for instance, sustainable aviation, um, developing new concepts to minimize carbon footprint through optimizing operations. So we are also working with our partners, uh, the US, Japan, um, to see how we can develop and implement aviation green lanes throughout the whole of Asia Pacific. And this would then provide a pathway for accelerated emissions reductions through fostering value chain collaboration, ensuring credibility, and also providing predictability and transparency to consumers. So FMC, with your focus on private sector resource mobilization can work with us and with multiple governments, like-minded governments, in developing low-carbon val low value chains and test bed solutions. And some of the government-led platforms in Singapore, for instance, like our MPA, which is the Maritime Port Authority's Green and Digital Shipping Corridors, they are root-based action plans can help to, get, to bring together a network of maritime and energy value chain stakeholders to exchange information, to catalyze pilot trials and establish a supply chain of zero or near zero greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to go to rapid fire CEO segments of this panel now. And uh, Hashimoto-san uh, from Mitsui OSK, uh, it's really wonderful to be here. And I have to say that in, every now and again at Davos, you get a sort of a sign of how quickly things are moving. And I think the shipping sector really over the last few years has uh, moved very fast. So we saw one of your incredible new prototype ships on the video at the beginning. You've been in, involved in advanced market commitments on carbon removal. Uh, you're involved in uh, other innovations in the fuel stock as well. Uh, what do you need in order to see this transformation go even faster around the world? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Yes, uh, that, uh, uh, since we joined uh, the, uh, the FMC uh, two years ago, that, uh, uh, we expanded the so many activities and actually tried to accelerate the low carbon and the zero carbon uh, the transportation uh, of the shipping business. The complication is that uh, the, uh, uh, as a shipping, uh, the general shipping company, we are covering the so many different kind of shipping uh, the businesses, uh, the containers and barcas and tankers and gas carriers, uh, the, uh, the ferry and uh, the, the cruise, uh, cruise businesses, and uh, each segment has uh, the different uh, requirement and natures, then, then uh, it uh, became cl uh, quite clear that there is no single solution uh, to achieve uh, the net zero. Uh, so that uh, uh, we, we definitely need uh, to establish a combination 
of the, the various the different kind of the the, uh, 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 the, uh, the procedures that, uh, that to to reduce our emission for the time being, and that uh, the, uh, in the long term that we uh, we definitely need to net zero. So that uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, ammonia, LNG, methanol, hydrogen, battery, we we couldn't uh, delete any option that, that, that because that, uh, the, the, uh, the, the very wide variety of the uh, 800, 900 vessels all over the world, that uh, the, uh, they, uh, they need that, uh, the, uh, the different uh, the solutions. And the, uh, we, are, we, are, we are trying to uh, the, uh, work with that, uh, the quite many uh, uh, industrial uh, players the shipyards, uh, engineering companies, and uh, the, uh, the large uh, customers and charters, and also that uh, the, uh, the quite uh, important uh, issue for us is that uh, the dialogue with uh, the, uh, the government uh, and international entities. So that uh, the, uh, so uh, we need that uh, to establish that technical uh, uh, achievement, commercial achievement, and also that uh, the other uh, the, uh, the kind of the political framework. So it's it's quite uh, that gigantic uh, the, uh, effort uh, we need. Uh, so, uh, we already started, and uh, the, when we started it, we we did not expect such a very big work. But uh, the, uh, the more and more that it became very clear that uh, we cannot do it alone. <coughs> we definitely need uh, to set up the quite strong team that, uh, that work together uh, that to achieve that, uh, the, uh, the various uh, the, uh, the different targets in uh, 90, uh, sorry, uh, the 2020s and 30s and 40s. So that uh, for us, that, uh, the, uh, 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 being the uh, member of uh, uh, FMC is uh, the quite uh, uh, quite uh, important uh, the, uh, uh, milestone, and uh, that we really want to accelerate uh, the, our our eff efforts uh, the, the, uh, uh, to do the, uh, the, the necessary actions, and to, uh, also that try to the, uh, organize that the quite many uh, the, uh, the, uh, team members uh, in, in shipping sectors uh, to materialize uh, our target. So, I, so it's really fascinating to see in this coalition of first movers, you know, every aspect of the value chain being uh, squeezed, from, uh, you know, across the membership, mm -hmm. right? So from from switching out the fuel in the ports through to the the, the composition of the, the of the actual vessels themselves to uh, to the fuel that the vessels are using, we, we start to see this. So. Now, I think maybe come to you, Dan, Dan Fisher, CEO of the Ball Corporation. So in all of those value chains, the issues of recycling become very important. You're um, leading in the aluminum sector, or aluminium, as I used to say when I grew up. Um, and I say that when I'm in London. Do well. you? <laughs> um, well, well done. Uh, so uh, what, what's, what's interesting, I think, is that you're using you know, advanced, uh, you know, advanced purchasing to sort of like pull pull things forward. So talk a little bit about the approach that you're taking and, and that, what, how, how you see these sort of value chain uh, relationships panning out. Yeah, I think um, we're, we're blessed uh, within the FMC to have our largest customers and our largest suppliers. So we've got uh, a common framework and a common language and a common goal. Uh, aluminum's a lot simpler maybe than uh, some of uh, my panelists and the more recycled content and the green energies that used to fuel that, uh, you can get to carbon neutral um, uh, in a very pragmatic and efficient manner. And uh, I think the Special Envoy, Kerry, made a comment, I think was the real challenge is, is always sitting in front of a board, for a public traded board. Uh, we're $15 billion in revenue, we're a billion dollars of free cash flow, signing a multi-billion dollar offtake agreement. That, uh, that sort of uh, betting that good will uh, equal um, well for your shareholders over time. And, and uh, um, we're very, very fortunate that uh, our, our partners, Novellus, uh, and ourselves were able to sit down, um, take the best of today in terms of uh, carbon neutrality and circularity performance in the world and design in infrastructure that they're building, the first uh, multi-billion dollar rolling mill in North America since the late 80s. It will be green energy, it'll be 85% recycled content. Uh, but most important, I think, in the manufacturing space, typically you're designing in the most efficient 
um, for today in the shortest payback period. That is not at all uh, what we believe you need. We believe you need an innovation center, uh, that there will be to be determined innovation and engineering and capabilities that will unlock future um, availability in, in a, a greener transportation pathway for our product. And so we subsidize that. We're not part of the IRA, we don't have subsidies, so this is Ball Corporation paying a little bit more right now. Uh, we won't see the first rolled coil coming off of those lines till 2028. Uh, so that's a, uh, that's a very challenging uh, dialogue, obviously, with your shareholders and your board to commit to that, that big of investment. But our belief is that it's a license to operate in the future and that will be the cheapest um, energy, uh, excuse me, aluminum in the world uh, at the time that that comes online. So we're uh, incredibly excited, very thankful for our partners, very thankful for uh, the First Movers Coalition to put us together and help us see uh, see the light there. So uh, we're excited to continue to tell the aluminum story and um, uh, more to come. Thank you, Dan. I think this, uh, for those watching, I, the, the, there's, a real pow there's a real power in this uh, value chain collaboration. And for those policymakers and the people who have to sort of put in fr the frameworks in place, you know, we've gone from, well, there's no demand signal, I'm going to be jumping off a policy cliff, to actually you've got uh, real uh, proof of, of collaboration and what that can mean. And I think that some of the innovation around the advanced uh, purchasing the advance to offtake agreements gives certainty to the policymakers. So this public policy partnership. It's a bit of a cliff when you've got 14-year-old twin girls and you haven't yeah, paid for yeah, college exactly. yet. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but we're just making the cliff a little uh, shallow. So there you go. But to and now to Anna Borgu, President and CEO Vattenfall. So Vattenfall, you know, famous historically as an energy company, you're involved in value chain collaboration in aviation, cement, and concrete. Uh, steel and, and trucking, I think, in, in this collaboration. And of course, famously, I think you've, you've probably got more headlines for the collaboration with Volvo on fossil fuel free steel uh, in the last year or so. Uh, but could you talk about, uh, again, what you would need uh, from the pol public policy side to respond and perhaps talk about how you're driving this kind of collaboration? Yeah, I'll be happy to. Thank you. Um, and I think. First and foremost, it's important to conclude that the, the business of tomorrow will not be run on fossil fuels. No. Uh, and I think that is the direction that is probably clear for everybody in, in this room. Uh, but I think that you ha if you haven't started to transform your business yet, it's really about time to think about how much can I lag behind without losing my competitiveness. And I think that is the starting point for, for us when we look at this from a business perspective. Um, and I think that what is needed now is probably not so much policies or subsidies, and I will come back to that. I think what is needed is that leaders in business, but also in politics, actually move. So I think that the move part of the First Movers Coalition is going to be even more important uh, going forward. And we've already heard many great examples of, of that. <clears throat> I think that when it comes to Vattenfall, we set out maybe some eight years ago um, on a journey where we say that we want to enable fossil freedom, and that is our business strategy. And ever since then, we have been transforming our business in three tracks, basically. Our own portfolio of assets, which we are working on continuously, everything that we um, purchase from our suppliers, but also everything that we provide to our customers and that they use. We are set out to be net zero by 2040 in all those scopes, including the customer usage, and we are well on the way. And we are, by the way, also meeting our financial targets and have done all the way. And I think that is the trick here. Um, when it comes to First Movers Coalition, we are one of the proud founders of the coalition, and we have committed so far to four sectors. It's uh, steel, cement, aviation, and trucking. And we do have initiatives going on in, in all of them. Uh, when it comes to steel, uh, the one that's been most talked about is probably the hybrid project together with SSAB, who is also a First Movers Coalition member, uh, a steel company, and also LKAB, a mining company, where we jointly um, built a power plant for producing fossil-free steel in a process where we use uh, green hydrogen made of fossil-free energy. Uh, and the sort of climate or the carbon footprint is basically zero from that steel. 
Uh, it, it is up and producing and is now about to scale massively. The demand is clearly there. Mm. That is not the problem. Um, and as you also mentioned, Volvo is one of the first off-takers mm. of this steel. Um, and um, we're also involved in um, uh, aviation, so regarding sustainable aviation fuel, but also electric fuels together with a number of partners. Um, we're also doing integrated development with our clients when it comes to fueling their transformation with fossil free energy together with BASF for example uh, or with Volvo also outside this sort of hybrid project. We have a number of, of projects going on where we simply build the energy that they need in order to make their transformation. I think that many of these bankable agreements mentioned within the coalition are extremely interesting and also a way of sort of fueling this transformation. <coughs> Maybe just one recent example where I know that Amazon, who is the first um, Movers Coalition member, uh, are buying trucks from Volvo, who is the first Movers Coalition member. Those trucks are electric and they are driven, they are made out of fossil free steel, produced by SSAB, who is the first Movers Coalition member in this hybrid plant, where Vattenfall, who is the first Movers Coalition member, provided the green hydrogen and the electricity needed to uh, produce that. And we clearly see the sort of business rationale in, in all these parts. So I think that this transformation is only in the beginning, um, and there are a lot of business opportunities out there to grab, but we should also be clear that of course there are challenges, um, and there will be obstacles, and there will be ups and downs, but that's why we are here. We are, that's our job as business leaders, to manage our businesses through that transformation and be successful also in the other end. And I think that First Movers Coalition is a great tool to do that in a business fashion. So is, is what you're all saying that there, there is a green premium, but that that's not an obstacle, that, that's something that can be cleared? I think that the green premium is often exaggerated uh, because you have to put it in relation to other things. If you take the steel, for example, the green premium in the beginning is estimated to be approximately 25%. But once the price for carbon emissions will increase, the relative difference between traditional steel and that will disappear. And I think if you translate that premium into what it means for an end consumer, and you put that fossil-free steel into a car that you and I would buy, the extra cost for the fossil-free steel in that car is equivalent to two USB sockets that you put into the car. So I think it's doable. <laughs> if the regulatory environment that is projected maintains itself, then it's not a premium. If, if you lapse those, it becomes a significant premium and a big risk in the future. So we just have to continue down the path to, to sustain what we've all laid out and what uh -huh. governments have laid out and then it's not a premium. No, and I think the best thing that governments and policymakers can make is not pouring subsidies into this, but rather de-risking the scaling of the technologies, because the capital is there to fund it then. Well, let's go to the capital then. So, <laughs> beautiful segue there. Thank you, Anna. Um, uh, so, to uh, uh, Carlos Torres, uh, chairman of BBVA, one of the first European banks, I think, to lead on sustainability and a member of the First Mover Coalition. Um, so, you're financing across the economy. What do you see as exciting from a financial perspective, from a banker's perspective, and what would you like to see from public policy in order to create this certainty going forward that uh, would help? Thank you. Um, what we see is uh, very exciting, and, and the stories we just heard uh, really are building up uh, an immense opportunity, and we're here to finance. We're secondary actors. We're not the ones doing the emitting. We're not the ones that need to do the investment, but we're definitely the ones who can and are supporting companies like yourselves in uh, carrying out the projects. Certainly, the First Movers Coalition is helping closing the, uh, the loop and uh, de-risking the projects so that they can be easily uh, bankable, like uh, and I was saying, and that is all very exciting. But I would have a much more uh, critical or complementary viewpoint from what uh, you two just described as regards uh, government policy. I think we're only scratching the surface, uh, as Secretary Kerry was mentioning earlier. Uh, we need to go a lot faster, we need to accelerate, and we need to get from first movers to all movers. And uh, what, what I see is that current policy uh, is, uh, is, is really challenging, a challenge. It, it's really not helping. 
eliminate the uh, green premiums because there was a lot of ifs in what you described, so the carbon pricing and all. What I see is that there is excessive focus or maybe uh, at times sole focus on the supply side as if the end user was not the ultimate reason why uh, we're emitting. Uh, and if we want to move from uh, well-meaning companies that have strategic goals and, and are forward-looking and are first movers, if we want to move from that to a widespread demand signal, we really need to change to a collective set of policies that are coherent, that are consistent, that get the job done, and we are far from that. Uh, even at times, we see how policymakers succumb to short-term pressures to isolate, which is crazy, isolate demand from the consequences of the supply-side policies, and um, and and it not need be uh, antisocial to uh, actually feel consu uh, make consumers feel the signals. Um, you can balance, and I think if we want not only to deploy faster the existing technologies, that makes sense, but also if we want to uh, have sufficient investment in developing and scaling the technologies that we need to solve many of the hard-to-solve problems, the hard-to-abate sectors, then we need consumers to feel the signal. And yes, we can compensate those that are most affected by the transition, that's very compatible, but we really need to uh, get our act together on the demand side. Uh, and certainly carbon pricing is an essential piece of the framework, and we're far from carbon pricing to be widespread. There's just so much of emissions that are today not uh, taken into account. So again, our role is secondary, we're here to support, and we would love to see so much more happening if, if only we could get policymakers to adopt, uh, to really bite the bullet. So can I just push you a little bit? I mean, I, I think that's a very succinct analysis of the sort of short-termism, long-termism, demand supply conundrum that we find ourselves in. But as a first mover coalition, a global first mover coalition, you know, how, how can the private sector lean into those politicians who are simply looking at the polling data with a misinterpretation of what's actually going to serve their, their people better over the long run? I mean, is there, is there, is there anything more that business can say? I mean, I don't want to use the word lobby, but I mean, where's the, how does the advocacy become effective? Well, laying out how inconsistent the current set of policies uh, are and how, uh, you can call it lobby. We're actually, as banks, not very effective at lobbying because um, everything we say is discounted a lot. And, and, um, and despite the fact that we are doing, uh, through our financing, we're having positive impact on society and really the underpinning of social progress and economic progress is the uh, private investment, which uh, is mostly financed through banks. Despite that being the reality, we, um, we're not heard much in, in, in the space and, and maybe others uh, and other uh, FMC leaders could have more success. We certainly are trying to influence in Europe uh, as much as we can. We did, it's not all negative, uh, don't get me wrong, it's just we have a lot of good things going and the carbon, uh, carbon, carbon uh, border adjustment mechanism, for example, is a good example. But we're just not doing enough. We you just need to step it up. Um, and it, it's a hard question what you're asking. I don't know what the best way would be to influence policymakers to really get their act together for the long term. Maybe all of us collectively speaking out for this to happen. So, Minister, can I put you on the spot for 60 seconds? How do we get the government collaboration to do what is so obvious uh, in, in, with the proof point of the First Movers Coalition, right? A few years ago, people were like, oh, these are hard to abate sectors. We're never going to make any progress. This is, and here we have, you know, tangible proof that there's collaboration along the value chain. And yet we haven't, on the government side, made as much international progress on pricing pollution and getting the kinds of collaboration necessary. What I, needs to happen? Well, I, 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 I can't speak for all governments. No, no, of course. But I think at least in, in, in our region, we try our best to have to work with different governments, like-minded partners, uh, on a set of um, interoperable taxonomy and standards. I think once we have a common platform, 
where we have agreement in terms of how um, we look at in terms of, of um, whether it, it is in the form of uh, verifiable carbon credits, rules of origin, um, in terms of your, your green hydrogen. And if we have, and, and of course, make sure that these standards then prevent greenwashing and all those other sort of uh, 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 untrustworthy type of transactions, I think it would be a very first small but very significant step, a giant leap for all of us. Um, having said that, uh, the other part is really um, working with um, like-minded partners, for instance, like the U.S. Um, the U.S. They're working very closely with uh, Singapore in terms of the, the IPAF um, framework. We, we are going to look at the entire ASEAN regional grid to see how um, we could work on a feasibility study, both from the regulatory, the legal, uh, and the social economic feasibility framework for the uplifting of about 650 million people living in ASEAN. So those are small steps, but they are actually, each step is a very significant milestone. And I think we need to accelerate that. Uh, a lot of times um, you find that in terms of governments, continuity of the government, of course, is, is also very important. Um, that consistency in terms of making sure um, the trust has been built uh, can actually bring us a, a lot further. Um, to your point about the carbon premium, uh, we started imposing carbon tax last year. Uh, it's a ratchet up. Uh, I think we're one of the first countries in our region to do so. It's a very bold step. Uh, but we have committed to making sure that whatever premiums we collect from the carbon tax itself is ploughed back into the development of renewable energy research, into low carbon uh, energy research, and so on and so forth. So um, I'm going to wrap up now. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, the takeaway from this, especially in a year where government continuity is on the ballot uh, for more people than not uh, on the planet, uh, that it can be done. There's no doubt that we can build an economy that can uh, operate at a low or, 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 or zero, uh, zero carbon. There's no doubt that we can do that with smart public policy to make it equitable and fair. The question is, can we go faster to meet the science, as, as Envoy Kerry said? So, from Davos, thank you very much. First movers, ladies and gentlemen. Rachel, can I just add something? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Usually I'm so overscheduled I don't get to hear. <laughs> <laughs> listening to this, i got to tell you, folks, you guys really are heroic. Yeah. I mean that. Uh, and, and Dan, I'll tell you, I'm confident that uh, uh, the Bull Corporation with Pepsi and Coca-Cola and their members, you guys made a profit. I won't tell everybody what it is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the reality is you can do this and it's good business. But if we don't do it, if we don't do it, we're going to pay much higher premiums, much higher price. Everything will cost more. Food chains, uh, the, the economic food chain will be completely disrupted. There'll be chaos in the, in the marketplace, in a sense. Whereas this is the orderly transition unfolding right before your eyes. And our goal is not to have everybody join the First Movers Coalition but to have a sufficient number of people in the First Movers Coalition that everyone is a mover. And, and we want to put ourselves out of business in terms of First Mover. <laughs> That's the goal. So thank you all very, very much.